Breaches and cybersecurity incidents are making headlines every day. What are you doing to be prepared? Welcome to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast, brought to you by Tripwire, the show that explores cybersecurity for the enterprise and how to identify and protect against cyber threats before they happen. Listen for techniques and best practices to harden your defenses against hackers. Now, here's your host, Tim Erlin. Welcome, everyone, to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. I am Tim Erlin, Vice President of Product Management at Tripwire. And today I am joined by Anthony Israel Davis, who is a senior manager at Tripwire, Tripwire responsible for cloud compliance and operations. So importantly, Anthony is a practitioner, not a salesperson. So he's on the the uh, corporate side of Tripwire. And that makes him particularly interesting for us to talk to. Today, we're going to talk about the Verizon DBIR, the Data Breach Investigations Report, which came out uh, quite recently. But there are plenty of people out there who are going to take apart the statistics and the data inside of this report. And I wanted to have a conversation with Ant more about sort of high level what the, the DBIR is for in our industry. So I think, uh, first of all, welcome, Ant. Glad to have you joining us. And let's start out with just uh, from your perspective, what is the, the DBIR actually good for in terms of your job and in the industry? One thing that the DBIR does is it takes the things that are going on in the cybersecurity space, particularly with breaches and incidents, and breaks them down into something that is both interesting to look at from a statistics standpoint, but then actionable to various industries or or people who are actually doing the work to defend the enterprise. So it's a very high level uh, overview of that. If you are a cybersecurity analyst and you're in the trenches, this might be old news. But if you are doing strategy, if you are trying to determine what to do in your space, this is a great report to understand what's going on out there, especially year to year. Uh, I don't know how many years this has been. It's been four, five, six. No, more than that. Yeah, it's been going for quite a long time. Since 2008, I think. What is that, 13, 13 years? Yeah. Yeah, so 13 years they've been taking a look at this. So we're watching trends in the, the cybersecurity space from, from breaches and incidents uh, year over year and seeing what's going on and how that's evolving with both the technology uh, in the, the cloud, for instance, uh, as well as in the attacker space and what that looks like. Uh, so it's pretty interesting. And uh, when I look at this the other aspect of this that is near and dear to my heart is when we talk about the cybersecurity skills gap. If you are interested in cybersecurity and don't know where to start, this report is a great resource. Uh, it is very interesting to read. Uh, there are a lot of good concepts in here, so you understand what the concepts are in the cybersecurity space. Uh, there's a lot of vocabulary, and uh, it's also really entertaining. So it's one of those things that if you read, you think, oh, this is going to be kind of a boring, dry thing. It's not. It's well-written. It's entertaining. The footnotes uh, are worth reading. So if you don't read the footnotes, you might want to check those out. And uh, so for those who are learning or new to the space, this is a great report just to get their heads around what the cybersecurity space looks like uh, and, and what's, coming up, what's going on. Um, in particular, you could take a look at the, there's an appendix that has, here's the year in review. Over the past 12 months, here are the major breaches or interesting things going on that you might be aware of. So it's a great resource. Yeah, that's interesting because I, I think it's gotten increasingly uh, more entertaining to read as the, the authorship has evolved. Of course, because it's not, it's not the same person writing it for the past 13 years. There's now, you know, obviously a team of people. And some of the, the voice has, has changed over time, uh, which is interesting to see. But you're... Your point about it being an educational tool, I think, is one that that maybe gets missed in some of the conversations about the DBIR. This idea that, you know, not everybody in cybersecurity is an expert, and there is this, uh, you know, whether, whether you want to argue it's it's perceived or it's real, there's a, a skills gap. Not everybody knows everything, and people have to learn. They have to start from somewhere, um, and that's a really interesting way to look at it. That you could use it as a tool. Uh, to learn about this space. Yeah, I, and, and I mean, if I were teaching this as a course, I would say 
you're new to cybersecurity. It's Cybersecurity 101. Read this report and let's talk about it uh, because there's a lot to talk about and it can go into a lot of different topics. You don't have to be uh, a hacker or know every little like thing about cybersecurity. This gives you a good introduction to that and a great place for somebody who wants to get into the, the industry to start. I feel like someone could teach a course on the DBIR itself uh, yeah. as a tool. It's an interesting, uh, I mean, it has interesting data from a cybersecurity standpoint, but it's also interesting in terms of how it structures the data, how they talk about the data. There, there. I was thinking about, you know, there are other reports that come out from other vendors, but the DBIR, DBIR has the staying power in part because of the history it has and the trending it can do. Yeah, I would agree with that. And there's it uses a, something called Veris, and we'll probably talk about this a little bit later. But uh, and I I sort of briefly touched on this one to talk about language, but it the the words that it uses are very uh, particular and, and very deliberate. And it uses a Veris framework, which is the vocabulary for event recording and incident sharing. So the way it categorizes that has a taxonomy and a schema that is very deliberate and allows them to take this data year over year and develop this this trending and this framework that actually allows us to, to do something with the data. So it's not arbitrary. It's very, very deliberate. And that ability to do trending is is key. If you if you if you can't categorize things consistently year over year, it makes it very hard to do meaningful trending. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Varus is an it's an interesting component in the in the DBIR because Varus Varus defines you know, what are they? They're, they're actions, they're threat actors, and they're assets, I think, are the, the three sort of key categories there. But then the Verizon team layers on top of that this concept of patterns. Um, and that's an interesting piece, too. This is why I say it could be you could teach a whole course on it, because the, there's, a, there's a connection between the patterns and the, the various categorizations that, that I think is, is interesting in terms of how it surfaces the results. Yeah, for sure. It allows to do some very interesting correlations. Um, the thing that Varus does for me that I, I really appreciate is it breaks it down in a way that allows us, as allows me to look at risk. And a lot of the risk frameworks use this same sort of language. Like if I look at FAIR, mm. the taxonomy uses actors, it uses impact, it uses uh, exploitability and vulnerabilities. So that allows you to take a look at this and, and do your own risk assessment based on what you know uh, coming out of the report, for instance. Uh, and and FAIR isn't the only way to look at that, but from a risk standpoint, you can think, who are the people who might be attacking me? Uh, what types of exploits or, or what might, types of things might they try to use to uh, get into my system and take, and take my data? So yeah, it's pretty interesting. Well, so that that brings me to, to sort of that the the second question that I wanted to touch on, which is is what do you actually do with with the the DBIR as a practitioner? How is it useful to you? Um, you mentioned a little bit there about the value of that common vocabulary, but does mm -hmm. does this annual event of the publication of the DBIR cause you to change things in how you do your job? That is a great question because do does cybersecurity change? in practice from year to year, and I would say not too much, but what changes is where do you invest your time and effort? What are the trends that we're seeing in the industry? Because we only have a limited amount of time, a limited amount of people, and a limited amount of you know, money to spend on cybersecurity. So where do you put that in order to get the most protection? Uh, I go back to risk. Right. If you're an insurer, you, you say, I'm going to insure this thing because it's valuable and it's going to cost me this much. I only have so much money to spend on cybersecurity and I want to spend it in the right place. And if you're protecting the things that are least vulnerable, then you're probably not spending it in the right way. So there are, I think, first of all, there's a couple of very just practical things that are coming out of this. So if you, there's a couple of great nuggets on just things to do, so actual direct action. And I might talk about those in a second. But the other thing is, where do I spend my time? If I look at um, where people are coming in, uh, it's very clear that you've got to patch. Uh, but you've got to patch intelligently because you can't patch everything all the time. 
So how do you manage your patching? Well, you patch the most vulnerable things, and you patch your most critical assets, and the things that are least vulnerable or least exploitable, maybe you can spend less time on those uh, because you can't be patching all the time. You've got other things to do. Uh, if you know that phishing is the number one exploit still, you really need to invest in educating your people and any sort of technical protections that help to uh, protect against those those phishing exploits. So you don't want to necessarily spend your time on those 1% things. They're, they're low likelihood. They might be high impact, so that's an assessment to make, but it tells you where to spend your money, which I think from a business standpoint makes a lot of sense. You are listening to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. Thousands of organizations rely on Tripwire to serve as the core of their cybersecurity programs. Why? Because we detect suspicious activity before it becomes breach. Our systems work on-site and in the cloud to find, monitor, and minimize a wide range of threats. With deep system visibility and automated compliance, we help you shorten the time it takes to catch vulnerabilities and ensure your organization is following the absolute best practices in cybersecurity today. For more information, visit tripwire.com. That's tripwire.com. Yeah, there's an interesting interesting shift that shows up in this, this year's um, report where for the the patterns over time in breaches, uh, basic web application attacks had had been at the top and growing for the last what one two three years more or less. But this year, social engineering climbed back up, and you know, social engineering, the largest uh, what they would call an action variety in that pattern, is phishing, um, as you point out. So that that does certainly, as a practitioner, that's got to give you, you know. Uh, evidence ammunition to 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 help influence where investments are made right yeah and phishing to me is the, is the scariest one because uh phishing emails come in we do as great a job as we possibly can to keep all those things from ever hitting somebody's inbox but they do come in uh and they can catch somebody on a bad day and if you're not paying attention suddenly bad things are happening so that's the the scariest one uh, because a lot of those those impacts that we see and a lot of the things that we're seeing, from ransomware to malware to credential theft, uh, are leveraging that social engineering, and uh, we're we're pretty good at fooling each other. Uh, we like we're very susceptible to those sorts of things. So that one's one we just got to have to stay on top of. You've got to be vigilant all the time. Yeah, this is interesting. I, I was um, I was considering what what the the DBIR doesn't provide or what it could do better. And you touched on something that jumped out at me, which is the the connection between the different types of patterns or the different actions, if you want to think about it that way. And there are, you know, to give credit to the, the DBIR team, I think they've that's a very difficult problem to solve with the data set they have. And they have paid some attention to which actions occur at what point in a breach life cycle or a, a yeah, breach life cycle. Yeah. But it's interesting that, you know, phishing sort of now is at the top of the list. It's been pretty high on that list for a while. Um, but that doesn't mean that, that uh, you know, the fish is the end of the, the line, so to speak. Because once once that successful phishing has occurred, its goal is to do something else, whether that's steal credentials or install malware. And so you have to think about the layered protections that are important. Yes. Um, behind phishing, right? Stopping phishing isn't just training our users to not click on links. Right. Oh, absolutely. Not don't click on links. Don't open things. But then, what do you do if you do? And actually, that's there were some really important. There was an important statement later on, and it wasn't just about phishing, but it was about errors in general. And to me, I thought this was uh, a critical point that we need to instill in everyone I, in, in the who has a computer. I, I don't even want to say the IT space, right? Everyone who's who's interacting with a computer. And that is errors, and this is a quote from the DBIR, but I, I love it so much, I'm going to quote it. Errors where the employee had that sinking feeling that they screwed up and reported it in the hopes that it could be quickly contained. These are both internal methods of discovery, and you don't already have an easy and fast way for people to report these kinds of breaches. You should look into it. Hmm. Why not cultivate your employees to be your early warning system? 
when it can have a great return on investment. So you, when you think you have made a mistake, you've clicked a link, you need to be able to report that right away because if you don't, it's one of those things like, oh, well, I know that, that, that sore that I've got, it'll probably go away. And suddenly, you know, you've got some, some terrible infection, right? That's the, the type of thing that we're trying to prevent. As soon as you can treat this, as soon as you can have some sort of intervention, the quicker that you'll be able to contain that and reduce the impact of that breach. And so I think having that ability to say, oh no, I messed up, um, and reporting it, we should be rewarded for reporting it because everybody makes mistakes. And that's just a way that we begin to establish and, and build that culture of security mindedness. So, and phishing is one of those, those areas as well. So that's, yeah, that that's a good one to take a look at. That reminds me a little bit of the some of the ethics training that that we're required to to take on an annual basis, where the focus is on, you know, reporting. There's no downside to reporting. If you're suspicious of anything, report it. We want you to tell us. That sort of uh, you know beat into you over and over again, so that you get that message. And with phishing, you know, we should go down the same path. Just report it. If you think it was a mistake, report it. If you clicked on a link that was suspicious but didn't look suspicious, but you have a sinking feeling about it, report it. Um, you know, that's an interesting perspective. Yeah. And it, it's always better to check and be wrong than not check and find out you've been hacked, right? And you've it, been owned. It is a cultural change to instill in people this idea that, that it's it's not that they've done something wrong. It's not their fault. They're not going to be shamed for reporting something like that because – I think people do feel that way, that they got duped or they got taken. Um, but, you know, even the information security professionals who spend day in and day out on this, uh, they can they can be caught out by some of these misrepresentations in phishing, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, it's the same thing. And we could probably go really deep on this and, and we don't have time for that here. And it would be an interesting discussion. But you're a victim. And so there's being ashamed of being a victim is is a very common thing. And that's actually mm -hmm. something that gets exploited by attackers all the time. And so if we can change that to say, I'm going to actually fight back, uh, then maybe that will, again, help build an, a more resilient response to being under attack. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it's a hard thing to do. It's a hard thing to change culture. Um, it's much easier to install a new agent. <laughs> right. Yes, for sure. sure. You are listening to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. Thousands of organizations rely on Tripwire to serve as the core of their cybersecurity programs. Why? Because we detect suspicious activity before it becomes a breach. Our systems work on-site and in the cloud to find, monitor, and minimize a wide range of threats. With deep system visibility and automated compliance, we help you shorten the time it takes to catch vulnerabilities and ensure your organization is following the absolute best practices in cybersecurity today. For more information, visit tripwire.com. That's tripwire.com. I want to change topics just a, a little bit because uh, this uh, DBIR came out um, you know, sort of almost at the same time as a new executive order around cybersecurity. And the executive order, it lays out essentially a, a roadmap of items. So we're, we're going to see um, impact from that executive order over time. You know, by itself, it doesn't do a lot on day one, but it sets out sort of standing orders to go form committees and do investigations and come up with recommendations. And one of the most interesting pieces in there, I think, is this... Uh, sort of cybersecurity incident review board, a governmental organization that's intended to review significant cybersecurity incidents and essentially do do forensics um, the way the NTSB, the National Transportation Safety Board, does investigations on, um, you know, transportation accidents. So um, I know you took a look at this as well. Is that something you think is actually going to work? Will it make a difference? I think... It will, uh, because one of the things that we do is lessons learned, and we do this for all kinds of things. We do it after we have had major projects. We do it after something has gone wrong in an IT environment. So having the idea of a, a lessons learned session and then 
continually improving a process is endemic to what we do on a daily basis. This is a, something that happens all the time, but it's not happening in a coordinated national way. And so what we see a lot of times is maybe a company gets breached and they do their own internal lessons learned, but nobody learns anything from that. And not only that, but if you take a look at who's doing the attacking, these are organized groups, whether they're nation states or they're organized crimes, but there are patterns that we see over and over again. But if those patterns aren't exposed, then nobody else gets to learn those lessons. And so because cybersecurity is so critical, I mean, we just saw this, right? Ransomware hits the, the pipeline in the southeast and suddenly we've got gas shortages, uh, either because people are panic buying or because they there really isn't any gas. Uh, so there's critical infrastructure that's getting hit. Uh, we need to be able to protect that in a more deliberate, cohesive way. And so the idea that we can continue to learn and get better makes sense. And we've seen this with accidents in the airline industry and the train industry, we learn lessons and we make improvements. We make improvements in our aircraft, we make improvements in our infrastructure, we make improvements in our in our trains. And that makes everybody using those critical things safer. We have not done that in the cybersecurity space. Uh, the interesting thing to me is not only can we learn more and then begin to become more resilient, but what does that mean for the industries that are affected. So for in instance, in the airline industry, there is an investigation. We find out there's something wrong. Take the 737 MAX. Everybody knows about this, right? One plane goes down, they start an investigation. Two goes down, now there's a pattern. And now suddenly you've got airlines or airplanes that are grounded. So that's affecting not only the airline industry, but the, the aircraft makers themselves. But that means that that aircraft industry, that Boeing, right, is responsible for that and they're responsible to fix that. What does that mean for the software companies that suddenly are getting hit by this, right? What does that mean for a solar winds or some other company that's breached? And how does that, A, make that company better and more resilient and better protected? But also, how does that impact them when they need to respond? So I, I think that there's, a lot of positives in this, but I think it's going to be a shakeup for the software companies and the service providers that this will begin to take a look at. So not painful only painful positives in some painful way. Painful positive, yes. We are not. We as an industry are not used to that level of transparency, and you know the first, the first organization to go through this this cybersecurity review board and have sort of all of their the skeletons in their closet laid bare um, as part of the report so that everybody else can learn from them, that's going to be a, a, a dramatic and, and um, unusual process until it becomes a usual process. Yeah, and how do we take that and say, I was a victim, I should have done other things, I could have done better to protect them, but I, again, I was that victim, so going back to what we're talking about in terms of reporting, uh, we don't want to expose those skeletons, but by doing so, we become resilient so you know i how many people are are don't like the ntsb like no you shouldn't investigate those aircraft we should just not care right i don't mind getting on an aircraft that's going to go down i'd rather not know about it so the general public benefits the individual companies might feel the pain but overall we become better for this sorts of of investigation it'll be it'll be interesting to see how they scope what a significant incident is that requires investigation because I completely understand if it's something that impacts uh, safety, you know, people. Um, so these critical infrastructure incidents absolutely make sense. Um, you know, theft of credit card data from an e-commerce company, probably not the kind of thing the cybersecurity review board needs to get involved in. Although being in the industry, I think it would really be helpful to have that level of transparency because those are the incidents where you know we can't publicly learn how to improve because we don't have the details of what happened right well and think about the hacks that are famous that we talk about uh we talk about target and equifax 
Uh, those weren't necessarily critical infrastructure, but they impacted a lot of people uh, yeah. and, and were very expensive. So I think it's going to be not just does this affect power grids or other types of critical industries, but how much money is this impact? How many people does this impact? And I, we would do ourselves a disservice if we limit it to just those things which we call critical infrastructure because the attackers don't necessarily care what they're attacking. Critical infrastructure, yes, is important from, say, a defense standpoint and from a uh, protecting the public standpoint, but people also care about their finances, right? If my credit card gets stolen, I care about that. That's important. And we want to make us a safer community, not just uh, in the physical sense, but in the financial sense, in the psychological sense. And the more we build that in, the, the safer we feel, the, the easier it is to do the things we need to do, right? If we have a safer internet, we feel more secure using that. I don't have to worry about, you know, grandma using the internet. Uh, I could feel safe about that. Um, so that's that's the type of thing that we, we care about. And that's important as well. Uh, just being able to use the things that make our lives better and easier. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that's, that's certainly an important aspect of it. And in many of these cases where there's been a very public incident, uh, those organizations have gone on to, to dramatically improve their cybersecurity practices because of that very public incident. And they would all happily take it back and avoid the public incident. But from a, a cybersecurity standpoint, they're probably in better shape than they, they were to start with. Right. Uh, and, or would be if it hadn't happened. And and we use those as teaching we do. instruments all the time. We talk about them and what happened, and they, they're great lessons for us to learn about how to protect uh, the one and aspect... V vendors use them as selling uh, anecdotes, too. <laughs> they do. I, I don't know who does that, but I've, I've heard that happens. Um, yeah, I, I think one aspect of this whole uh, NTSB-style commission that's interesting from an industry standpoint, particularly in software, is now what? To, how does that affect regulation? Uh, because if you take a look at airlines and you take a look at trains and even roads there are regulations that guide those mm -hmm. types of things so are we going to start saying in order to distribute your software in order to sell your software you need to meet these standards uh these regulations that are, are there going to be tests that traditionally have been audit yeah yes right have, i mean we've, we've you, nobody has looked at your software it could be good it could be bad we won't know until the, yeah. it has a CVSS score and so, somebody well, tells I, us about it, right? <laughs> I think the answer is yes. I mean, <laughs> right. you're going to have a series of, of investigations at some point. There will be conclusions. And I think, you know, the end result of those conclusions will be a drive to, to legislate um, some kind of regulation around around software, depending on... I just hope they're conclusions that make sense Yeah. in terms of turning them into regulations. So, for example, there was a you know, the California regulation around uh, certain devices not shipping with default passwords that, you know, aren't changed on first use, that kind of thing is, right. that seems good. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the the distance between legislation and technology can sometimes be a difficult one to, to, to span. Yes, absolutely. It, it can. And we'll see how that uh, plays out. Uh, I mean, I think as we talk about it, ultimately, we're driving towards better outcomes but that's not always an easy path and sometimes it's messy uh, but it'll be an interesting one to see uh, but as we become more integrated and dependent on these services uh, it's going to be critical uh, for us to make sure that these services are are safe they're resilient they're reliable that we can protect them um, and it's gonna be a constant battle uh, but we have to keep up uh, or we're not going to have what we have. Yeah. All right. And I appreciate the time. It was um, certainly an interesting conversation. I think we could probably keep talking for a long time, but uh, oh, sure. we'll, uh, we'll try and cut the listeners loose at a reasonable, <laughs> reasonable duration here. Um, okay. For everyone listening, I hope it was as interesting to you as it was to me. And uh, I'm looking forward to the next podcast. And I'm looking forward to everybody uh, subscribing and tuning in for that next podcast. So thank you so much for spending time with us. All right. Thank you. 
You have been listening to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. Join us next time as we explore stories of people protecting people and techniques and best practices to harden your defenses against hackers. We'll talk to you next time on the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast.